Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Today we're here to talk about Alfred Hitchcock's Rebecca. If you're new to this channel, my name is Miriam and in here we aim to discover and discuss a lot more about classic movies. And on this day, ahead of Netflix release, by the end or roughly by the end of October, of the new adaptation of Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca. I was basically caught up by the hype and I succumbed to the lure of revisiting Alfred Hitchcock's version of this amazing novel. Thus, in this video, we'll touch upon seven different aspects that I believe are essential to assess why this movie is still very relevant and how it has influenced both cinema and popular culture. I don't know about you, but in my case, it had been a very long time since I had watched Alfred Hitchcock's Rebecca and even longer since I last read the novel, which I did incidentally in Spanish, not even in English, which was something that I wanted to correct and I have. So by the time I'm filming this video, I have watched again Rebecca and I have read the book again, but in English. So I'm ready to go. I'm pumped for this video. What a great film. What a fantastic novel. And I have to say that the movie is quite faithful to the original material, even though there's a substantial difference with the death of Rebecca, but that has to do mainly because of the Hays Code that was in place in Hollywood and with which they had to comply. So that was really great to be able to assess firsthand. So I would highly recommend that you watch this film but also read the novel. It is a magnificent experience, I'd say, especially if you want to watch or if you're going to watch Netflix new adaptation, I think it's best to have the source material fresh in your mind because it's not supposed to be a film that stems from Alfred Hitchcock's version. Moreover, because the book is considered one of the best sellers, greatest publications of the 20th century, the author was also highly influenced by Jane Eyre which is one of my favorite books of all time. But in addition to that, it has also other components, other factors, other aspects that are just as fascinating. So again, that's what we're going to talk about today. Seven different aspects that you need to know about Alfred Hitchcock's Rebecca. So sit back, don't relax, and with no more ado, Let's jump into it. For this video, also, I reread part of the Francois Truffaut interview with Hitchcock, and specifically, obviously, the parts in which they discuss Rebecca. And it was very, very interesting. There's a moment in the interview in which the master of suspense, Alfred Hitchcock, says that in many senses, we could consider Rebecca as the story of a house and that Manderley, the mansion in which most of the action takes place, is a prominent character within the plot, within the story. And I couldn't agree more. In case you don't remember or you haven't watched them yet, I made two videos dedicated to the use of architecture in Alfred Hitchcock movies and particularly the first video featured the houses, the gothic ambience and I talked about Rebecca and Manderley and essentially without going over everything I said there, essentially what we went over in that video is the fact that Manderley again plays a very important role and how in Gothic literature houses were this space in which all sorts of sinister, supernatural, crazy things happened. Houses, castles, churches, buildings in general in that kind of fiction were always harboring some sort of secret and for me speaking in more psychological terms they were an analogy for what our minds are disclosed 
space where ghosts inhabit and where supernatural things happen to and all sorts of demons and dark things dwell so for me that's why gothic fiction it's still so vivid and so relevant because it just speaks volumes about our human minds and particularly again Manderley is a paradigmatic case of a modern use of that fiction to provide suspense to provide tension and it is in both cases beautifully incredibly done furthermore Alfred Hitchcock also started which is something again that I covered in those videos. Alfred Hitchcock also initially started as a set designer and art director. So he was very knowledgeable with all the technical aspects of filmmaking. In this case, again, for the amazing creation of Manderley, they used a miniature. I think that they in fact used two miniatures, one of which was a very large reproduction and they even did a miniature of the road leading up to Manderley which is what we see when the couple arrive to the mansion there's a miniature car also that we see on the film and the incredible atmosphere and the way it was shot it was achieved by a combination of miniature photography and matte painting Hitch again because of that background took enormous advantage of architectural spaces in his films and they became a pivotal part of his storytelling and a very important piece of the suspense puzzle. It was almost an understanding of those spaces as canvases would be to a painter. We can't forget that Rebecca was Alfred Hitchcock's first production in Hollywood but the art direction team working in this movie was already an established one since this was a David O. Selznick production and that means that the movie that this particular team worked at a year before was none other than Gone with the Wind. The heads of the department in this case as they were also for Gone with the Wind were Lyle Wheeler and William Cameron Menzies two of the most prominent art directors of their time and in that particular super artistic team we can find Albert Simpson who was the matte painter for this movie we have also the head of special effects Jack Cosgrove and illustrator Dorothea Holt someone we'll talk about later on these people the artists the technicians made possible what Alfred Hitchcock envisioned and boy they did a terrific job so thanks to them we all felt that Manderley existed somewhere that Manderley was real and I wanted to pay a little tribute to all those departments that made such beautiful creations for the screen another thing that was pointed out on the Truffaut book is that the use of miniatures in this case helps enhance the atmosphere of suspense and also helps give the movie a sort of a period movie look and also that of a fairy tale I think that the cinematography in this case was outstanding which was by George Barnes who was the mentor incidentally of Greg Toland one of the greatest cinematographers in movie history also a predecessor of the techniques that Toland used for Citizen Kane. So there are many similarities between the photography in Rebecca and the one in Citizen Kane. It's not so much that one film influenced the other, but that both professionals really gravitated towards the same techniques at the time, and especially Citizen Kane, which came one year after Rebecca in 1941 is highly highly appraised or highly regarded because of those technical advances and the way it is shot and filmed so it again speaks about an era in filmmaking in which cinematography especially black and white cinematography was of an outstanding quality it established 
to for many other productions a narrative direction a way to film certain plots and it is in short because of all these amazing people that brought so much to all the films they participated in when we think of rebecca of alfred hitchcock's rebecca another way to look at it is as a gothic fairy tale and as an interpretation of cinderella with some hints of bluebeard i also did another video on billy wilder and the use of fairy tales which is i'd say quite interesting if you also like me love fairy tales and their influence in other art forms in this case cinderella i'd say is the ultimate hollywood fairy tale we've seen it adapted and reenacted in so many movies in so many genres i think for reasons that i'm not going to go over in today's video i think that is the again the paradigmatic fairy tale in terms of hollywood narratives and this case is a twist to that story in rebecca we find a character played by john fontaine who is an orphan nameless character which is something that i only figured out the last time that i watched this movie and i can't believe it took me so long sorry about the the intermission here but what's funny with that is that in the book Truffaut in that conversation with Alfred Hitchcock is convinced for some reason that John Fontaine's name is Constance and in my case I just thought that oh yes I know the character's name when I didn't so I'd say it's one of the most fascinating aspects of the novel and also of the movie how the main character has no name and yet you think you know the name it is brilliant in any case i think what do you think what could be the perfect name for the second mrs the winter let me know in the comments down below coming back to what was saying we find the character an orphan nameless woman who is the paid companion of a sort of a stepmother called mrs van hopper and who is wooed by a charming prince in this case maxim the winter and then when she goes to the castle she encounters the real evil stepmother in mrs danvers also in terms of what happens with the protagonist the female protagonist in cinderella is that she goes through a series of humiliating experiences that she has to overcome in order to achieve a higher status for all those reasons the similarities between cinderella and rebecca are quite quite obvious and also bluebeard's fairy tale too in the sense that there's a room in the house that could harbor a secret that you're not allowed to go in so what Hitchcock did and brought to his own world is taking all these references and infusing them with more suspense and a narrative style that really reinforced or enhanced or took advantage of all the psychological traits and subtext that the novel also has and that all those characters have and also the way that rebecca is described which is also a very prominent character that in this case we never get to see yet we feel we have a clear picture of her in our minds same as when we read the novel and i think that's also a brilliant brilliant thing of both the novel and the film so if you see how i'm dressed today you will see that in my humble way probably not so fashionable way this is a tribute to rebecca and i should ask my american australian british friends how would you call this is this a cardigan is this uh jumper well i can tell you that in spain we call this rebecca's and that is 
precisely because of this movie. Did you know about this? So what happened was, as you can imagine, that the movie was, as you probably know, a resounding success for Hitchcock, for David O. Selznick, not just in America or in the US, but a worldwide effect, a worldwide impact. And especially for some reason in Spain, we loved the fashion in this movie. And even today, if I'm buying this or if I'm wearing this, I will refer as this again as a Rebecca. So isn't it amazing the power that films had back then it is amazing so this particular piece of clothing became quite fashionable in spain especially in the 40s and the 50s however the irony of it is that john fontaine's name in the film is not rebecca and for some reason this became known again as Rebecca's, not as fontaine's for instance so we just liked the clothes we just liked rebecca there you go. What are you wearing? Rebecca's. Another thing that is brilliant about this movie is the casting. And there is so much that you need to know about how the casting process went. The casting is undoubtedly perfect for the story. There are specific parts, but especially Judith Anderson as Mrs. Danvers is absolutely brilliant and iconic in that part and even right up to the part played by George Sanders, your ultimate heel, the seductively conniving Jack Favell, who's Rebecca's favorite cousin. What you need to know about the casting for Rebecca is that much like what happened with Gone with the Wind, a film that was also produced by David O. Selznick, is that for the female lead, there was a somewhat similar process as to what happened for Gone with the Wind since it had had such a tremendous success since it was also an adaptation of a very popular novel David O. Selznick felt that this was the way to go to create all this hype and have all the most prominent actresses of the time tested for that part and in this case it was not such an arduous task as it was for Gone with the Wind but there was a much reduced list of actresses to play the part that ultimately played John Fontaine and those actresses were Margaret Sullivan who had played the part of the second Mrs. De Winter in a radio adaptation of the novel that came out I think in 1939 with Orson Welles of all people playing Maxim De Winter and you can find that radio broadcast or that radio play in internet so I'll leave a link down below if you want to listen to it. So Margaret Sullivan was a clear contestant for the part also was Anne Baxter who at the time was only 16 and for some reason again Vivian Lee who was the perfect choice obviously for Laurence Olivier she was tested for the part and you can see footage of that test also in YouTube as well but I think that Vivian Lee would have been perfect if the actual the real Rebecca was brought up in some sort of flashback. It's quite difficult for me to picture Vivian Lee as the second Miss, Mrs. The Winter. And funnily enough, David O. Selznick wanted Olivia de Havilland also to test for the role. And I've seen two different versions as for why this didn't happen. One, because she was working for Warner Brothers and the studio wouldn't lend her again for another production that was not a Warner Brothers production. And the other reason was that Olivia immediately just pulled out of the project because her sister was going after the part. So both reasons make sense. For the part of Maxim the Winter, there was also a bit of a process to find the right actor for the part. Initially, David O. Selznick wanted Ronald Coleman to play the part, but he refused because he felt that in this movie, the female character had a more substantial role. And then they considered other actors such as Leslie Howard, 
uh, William Powell. I, I can't truly, really, as much as I love William Powell, I can't see William Powell as Maxim de Winter as this very stern and quite, un quite unagreeable and somber character. Also Melvin Douglas I've read and even Walter Pidgeon but Laurence Olivier who had just played the part of Heathcliff in Wuthering Heights. He became after Coleman's refusal the first choice. For the part of Mrs. Danvers I haven't seen that there were many options. The only thing I've read is of Judith Anderson who was an Australian actress, fantastic actress who was I think younger for the part than the picture we get in the book. She was around 42. As I've checked to from the conversation Hitchcock had with Truffaut, he instructed Anderson to blink as little as she could and also the way he presents the character. We rarely see Mrs. Danvers walking or if she does so, it is in a way in which she seems to be gliding. So all this is because he wanted her to appear as uncanny and as unearthly as he could and boy did they achieve that. There have been many villains in Alfred Hitchcock movies which is something that I just touched upon in a recent video but Mrs. Danvers in Rebecca is quite something else. <laughs>